Let's talk a little bit today about a priori versus a posteriori reasoning, and why I think it's the case that utilizing more a priori reasoning is going to make you a much more convincing debater, much more effective in arguments. So first off, to define the terms if you're not familiar with them, both are Latin adjectives that describe types of knowledge. So a priori refers to knowledge which comes from theoretical reasoning alone. This is knowledge which is deducible given no outside information. And now its opposite, a posteriori, describes knowledge which has to be gotten through observation and experience of the outside world, of the real world. Now for some examples to kind of clear it up. Um, some examples of a priori reasoning or a priori arguments would be every mother has a child or all bachelors are unmarried men. You can hopefully see how these are sort of self-contained arguments that we don't need to refer to some outside bit of information to prove that they are true. In a way, they sort of uh, prove themselves. They're self-contained is the best way to think of it. Now, some examples of a posteriori arguments. I could say, today it is sunny. Or for another example, I could say, your hair, you that is watching this video right now, is red. So you can see how, unlike the a priori arguments, I have no way to prove that either of these statements is true if I don't go to the outside world and make an observation. So that's what makes them different. Okay, so now that we've defined the terms, I want to go back to that first claim I made in the video. And that's that a priori reasoning is going to be much more effective at changing people's minds. It's going to make you a much more effective debater. So why do I think this is the case? Well, I think it's most convincing to consider what an a posteriori argument looks like to show its weakness and to show why a priori then must be the better way to debate. You see, if someone is skeptical in a debate, if someone is skeptical of your point, they won't be convinced by you citing statistics in research papers. I think we've all experienced the futile, what I call the battle of the research papers, when those on both sides of an argument claim to be citing some prestigious research paper to back up their claim in that argument. Everyone watching this argument knows that neither side is going to budge, so the argument will never really change someone's mind. It exists really only as a form of self-validation for each side. You see, the only reason they will even bother to make these sorts of claims is just to really save face. They're just assuring themselves that their opinion is valid and well-researched, that they're not just pulling it out of thin air. The problem is that this type of argument just ends with the claims being made, but the participants can't pursue the issue any further than that. Unless, of course, they're willing to go and get the research that, th that was cited, read it thoroughly, and only then, after possibly hours of research, carefully proceed with the argument to get to the truth. This is, of course, how good science is done, and it's important stuff, but it's realistically never going to be done in the case of casual verbal debate or a casual argument between friends and family. Or even in a more public formal forum, like a speech, it's still very unlikely that most people listening to that speech or watching that video are going to read the primary sources in the studies that were cited in your a posteriori argument. So I think this flaw makes apparent the power of a priori argumentation, because it allows for the instant continuation of the argument at hand. There's no need to carefully compare data points in research papers or to go investigate something in the outside world. You can begin and end an a priori argument without anybody even leaving their seats, because they are self-contained arguments. If someone is putting forth a poor point in an a posteriori argument, you likely won't be able to catch it short of having some first-hand knowledge about the claim being made. If someone is putting forth a poor point in an a priori argument, the flaw in logic should be much more readily apparent, and you can correct it on the spot. Now before I continue, I'd like to add a little bit of nuance. You see, philosophers like to split things into these two neat categories, with every piece of knowledge either being priori or posteriori. But I think that for the posteriori arguments anyways, they're much more like Gen Z-esque in that they sort of exist along a spectrum. Some a posteriori arguments are completely alienating. They serve as hard stops to the argument, essentially 
bits of knowledge which cannot be verified by anyone hearing the argument on account maybe of their being so esoteric. Now, some a posteriori arguments, on the other hand, will be such common knowledge that their use won't really be the cause of any disagreement. So, for example, trying to make some argument which hinges entirely on some arcane piece of information, where that arcane bit of information is necessary to make people agree with the point you're trying to prove, it's going to be difficult. If people aren't convinced of that one bit of knowledge which they might need some specialist training to understand, they're not going to ever truly believe your point. Maybe at best they'll trust your judgment on the subject, but they aren't really going to be convinced of the truth of your argument themselves because they won't understand it. And they're just not going to go do the necessary research themselves in order to understand it. Now, an example of an even worse type of a posteriori argument is one which hinges upon a claim which is contentious. If someone is ideologically opposed to your argument, and it hinges on some a posteriori bit of data that you've got from a research paper, then that person is never going to believe that bit of information. They know that it's not expected of them socially to actually go read the paper you're citing. And it would be much harder for them to actually change their mind on this particular point, likely for social reasons, so they're just going to claim that whatever you're saying is false, and that will put an end to the discussion. Now, even if what you're saying is completely true, it doesn't matter. It was what I'm calling too a posteriori. Now, on the other hand, arguments can be hardly a posteriori. So, for example, claiming that the sky is blue is technically an a posteriori argument. But nobody is going to object to you making that claim as part of your argument. It'd be ridiculous if they stopped you and went, oh, wait, hold on, buddy. I want to need a citation for that. You know, it's just people just let it pass by. Also, you can get away with easily making a posteriori arguments when they take advantage of previously held biases. So, for instance, I think saying something bad about bankers isn't usually going to raise many people's eyebrows because there generally exists already a distrust of bankers among people. So just remember that a posteriori arguments, although they can technically be the same thing, they can be more or less objectionable and something to keep in mind as you're making your arguments. All right, so now to conclude, I'd like to give just a few examples of arguments given in two manners, both an a priori and an a posteriori manner to hopefully illustrate how the former is much more convincing. Okay, so in example one, imagine that a child wants to convince his parents to take him to the carnival that's in town, but they're concerned about the safety of the rides. So an a posteriori argument from the kid might sound something like this. I want to go to the carnival. The rides are actually totally safe. I've read a research paper saying how more people actually die from shark bites than get killed on carnival rides every year. Now for an a priori form of that same argument. I want to go to the carnival. I think it will be a lot of fun, and I've been working really hard in school and would appreciate a night of fun. I'll be with my friend's parents the whole time, so we won't get into any trouble either. So I think as a parent, they're not really going to be convinced by this, this research paper talking about how uh, you know shark bites actually kill more people than carnival rides. It can obviously be misleading. And anyways, they're not going to find that research paper and look at it anyways. They're just going to say, no, because I told you so, you know. But I think if they, if the kid was to focus more on these uh, reasoning from an a priori perspective and talking about why it would benefit him, why it would benefit the parents and what he's been doing to earn it, all things that they already know, then he can, this can be a much more convincing argument. Now for another argument. Imagine you were trying to convince someone of the dangers of climate change what would be more effective? So for the a posteriori stance, the CO2 levels are rising at 1.4 parts per million per year, and we will expect a corresponding increase of 0.09 degrees Celsius per year given this increase. We expect the ice caps will then, as a result, be reduced by 30% in volume by the year 2050, and we would expect because of the sea levels to rise 10 to 20 feet. And now for the a priori argument, Oh my god, look at the dead polar bears! They're gonna fucking die! They can't swim! Which one do you think is more convincing? I'm not sure, but I definitely know which one is used more often. So hopefully you can see how in these examples, how these 
a priori arguments. They're arguments which can be fully digested and fully explored in one sitting. And they can be much more convincing than the arguments which are a posteriori in nature. So I'd encourage you to try and rely a bit more on this a priori reasoning in your day-to-day life and just see if it helps you to be a more convincing person. So anyways, thanks everyone for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Like, comment, subscribe, and have a good day.